that. Okay. Put it on the calendar for Tuesday. Hello, this is Ed Bechtel. I'm here again at the Slatington Library to do our monthly sweet spot presentation. Um, I'm from Bechtel's Pharmacy. Today we're going to talk about um, medications for type 2 diabetes. We'll take a moment to review some of our sweet spot basic truths. Most of us know that there are two types of diabetes. Um, in type 1 diabetes, your body basically doesn't make insulin. You have to take insulin from an outside source to live. In type 2 diabetes, your body makes insulin um, but doesn't use it properly. No matter which kind of diabetes you have, the complications that can develop um, if your blood sugar isn't controlled are the same. <coughs> What should your blood sugar be? Um, fasting blood sugar, uh, normal is between 80 and 100. The uh, American Diabetes Association considers 125 or below to be uh, controlled. The American uh, Society of Endocrinologists says 130 or below is controlled. After you eat, your sugar naturally goes up. Um, and you want it to be um, below 180. At 180 is when um, complications from diabetes begin to occur. We control our blood sugar by using a three-pronged approach. A three-pronged approach. Um, some call it the three-legged stool approach. The three um, legs are diet, exercise, and medications. You know, two of those three things are totally under your control, and even the third one, um, taking your medications properly, is pretty much under your control. So, um, no matter what your healthcare providers do, um, it's up to you to uh, keep your blood sugar under control. So today we're going to discuss the risk factors, symptoms, and complications of type 2 diabetes look at what you can do to manage your diabetes, and discuss common medications used to treat type 2 diabetes. So let's start the new year with a quick review. If you've been attending sweet, our Sweet Spot classes, just sit back and relax while we cruise through the next few slides. Diabetes is a chronic condition that affects the way your body metabolizes sugar, or glucose, your body's main source of fuel. Type 2 diabetes develops when your body becomes resistant to insulin or when the pancreas stops producing enough insulin to take the sugar out of your bloodstream and into the cells. The exact cause of type 2 diabetes is not known, although excess weight and inactivity appear to be contributing factors. Type 2 diabetes is all about balancing insulin and glucose. Insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas that works to lower the amount of sugar in the bloodstream and move that sugar into the cells where it can be converted and used as energy. Glucose, or sugar, is the main source of energy for cells that make up muscles and other tissues. Sugar is absorbed into the bloodstream either from digestion of food or from the liver where it's stored. Glucose in the bloodstream then enters cells with the help of insulin. Think of insulin as the key that unlocks the door of the cells, allowing the glucose to enter and the cell to utilize the glucose for energy. In type 2 diabetes, the process works improperly. Instead of moving into your cells, the sugar builds up in your bloodstream. Weight, physical inactivity, and fat distribution are all related when it comes to risk factors to developing type 2 diabetes. Being overweight and having more fatty tissue 
causes your cells to become resistant to insulin. If your body stores fat primarily in your abdomen as opposed to elsewhere, such as your hips or thighs, your risk of type 2 diabetes is greater. Also, the less active you are, the greater your risk of type 2 diabetes. Physical activity helps you control your weight, uses up glucose as energy, and makes your cells more sensitive to insulin. Certain risk factors are not changeable as much as we would like them to be. Things such as family history of diabetes or a history of gestational diabetes, diabetes that develops during pregnancy, will increase your risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Although the cause is unclear, African Americans, Hispanics, American Indians, and Asian Americans are more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than Caucasians. Also, the risk of type 2 diabetes increases as you get older, specifically after age 45. That's most likely due to the fact that people tend to exercise less, lose muscle mass, and gain weight as they age. You can greatly decrease your chance of developing type 2 diabetes by maintaining a proper weight, exercising regularly, and following a balanced diet. Some medications. When I yep. was on the birth control many, many years ago, I became diabetes diabetic. Yep. There and there, there are some uh, antipsychotic medications that'll raise blood sugar. So, if, if somebody has that genetic predisposition to type two diabetes, you know, taking those medications can actually push them toward, you know, full blown diabetes. Um, corticosteroids, prednisone, uh, methylprednisolone, those will raise your raise your blood sugar and push you toward that. So, you know, I, I had one patient who, um, she wasn't diabetic until um, she got cancer and they were using corticosteroids in part as part of her treatment for the cancer and the, the steroids that they used, um, you know, pushed her into developing diabetes and until she was done with her chemo, um, they actually started her on insulin. But even after she finished her treatment, um, she still, I, I mean, her sugars never went back down to normal. So, I'm trying to think, I, I don't think she's on insulin anymore, but she's, she's on other medications to control her blood sugar. Diabetes affects many major organs including your heart, blood vessels, nerves, eyes, and kidneys. Long-term complications develop gradually, but warning signs are easy to ignore, especially during the early stages. One common complication of diabetes is neuropathy. As excess sugar in the blood injures the tiny blood vessels that nourish the nerves, Neuropathy causes pain, numbness, burning and tingling in the express, uh, extremities, especially the legs, hands, and feet. The sensation usually begins at the lips, at the tips of the toes and fingers, and gradually spreads upward. Poorly controlled blood glucose can eventually cause the loss of all sense of feeling in the affected limbs. Excess sugar in the blood also damages the small blood vessels in the kidneys that filter waste from the body. Diabetes can damage the blood vessels of the retina. This condition is called diabetic retinopathy. It can also dramatically increase the risk of many cardiovascular problems. These include high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, narrowing of the arteries, atherosclerosis, um, and increase your risk of heart attack and stroke. Nerve damage and poor blood flow to the feet increase the risk of various foot complications, including bacterial and fungal infections. Left untreated, cuts and blisters can become serious infections. The importance of controlling your blood sugar levels through diet, exercise, and medication 
cannot be stressed enough. So how do you know you have diabetes? Excess sugar in your bloodstream can make you thirsty, increase your fluid intake, and therefore increase urination. And if, you, if you think about the, the, the processes of the body, when the blood sugar gets over 180, the body recognizes that as being a toxin, as a poison, and the body wants to get rid of it. So the kidneys start to filter it out. And as it's taking that excess sugar out, it takes fluid with it. So you become slightly dehydrated. When you get dehydrated, it makes you thirsty. <laughs> so, you know, if you think of the, the processes, it, it all makes the, the, the symptoms mm -hmm. tend to make sense. Also, without enough insulin to move sugar into the cells, your body becomes tired and your muscles are depleted of energy, making you hungry. So if the sugar is floating around in your bloodstream and is not getting in, you know, there are cells that, you know, in your brain that are not getting enough sugar and that, that starts to tell you that you're, you're hungry. So that's another one of the you know, the primary system, symptoms of, of diabetes, the excess thirst, excess urination, lack of energy, hunger. Other symptoms include blurred vision, a result of fluid being pulled from the lenses to combat the high sugar levels, slow wound healing, and frequent infections because when your blood sugar is up, the white blood cells, the cells in your bloodstream that help fight infection, don't work properly. Uh, slow wound healing, frequent infections, and areas of darkened skin. These show up most often in the areas of skin folds, such as the armpit pits or the neck. The vast majority of people with type 2 diabetes will check their blood sugar levels at least once a day. If this is done first thing in the morning before any food, it's considered fasting. As we discussed while we were reviewing our, our basic truths, the goal of fasting blood sugar should be between 70 and 130. If the blood sugar sample is taken one or two hours after a meal, the goal is less than 180. Your doctor will tell you how often to check your blood glucose levels. An A1C, a hemoglobin A1C, is a blood test done at the doctor's office that indicates your average blood sugar over the past two or three months. It measures the percentage of blood sugar attached to hemoglobin, the oxygen-carrying protein in red blood cells. The higher your blood sugar levels, the more hemoglobin you'll have with sugar attached. The average life of a red blood cell is about three months. So that's why, you know, when your sugar goes up, the sugar, you know, the sugar attaches to the cell. And then that cell carries that until the cell dies. So, so that's how they get the two, three months. Yep. I never figure that one out. Yeah. Two, five, yeah. Three months, yeah. So <coughs> arguments then. You do pretty good for two, three months. Mm -hmm. Two weeks before you have your doctor's appointment, you go on a cruise and you pig out. Okay. Is that going to really fluctuate that number that much? Because um, that's our scenario that we have. It, like I said, it's it's a picture. It's an like average. an average of the. So, so if you if you if your blood sugars are are running normal mm -hmm. through ten weeks, and then. You, you you go off you go off yeah it's gonna it's gonna show up on that on that test well See, I, I you have kind of, i was kind of planning changing my appointment but then it's like no this is real life let's get right. that right amount. i mean i'm not gonna pig out or on the cruise but i'm sure i'll have some occasionally have a dessert or something like that sure you know? I, i'm you can, if if you if you feel like you're denying yourself, then when, when you do have a weak moment, 
then you tend to go way overboard. So, yeah, have dessert, but share your dessert with right. somebody. And now, um, um, when I want a piece of chocolate, I'll eat it, but it's only one piece, where before it was four or five pieces. Right. You know, so I'm basically a chocoholic. Yeah. This is hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing is, you know, if you're on, if you're on the, if you're on the cruise, I mean, you may be able to do more exercise than what you would normally do at home. So, you know, th there may be some balance there where you're doing more than you would normally do, and that's going to burn off some of that excess sugar. So, I mean, you can go on vacation, but diabetes doesn't take a vacation, so you're going to take your diabetes with you. And you just have to plan on how you're going to handle, handle things on your vacation. Um, you know, if, if you're controlling your blood sugar just with diet and exercise, mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, you know, if your, your diet's changed, maybe you need to ch change the exercise. If you're, if you're taking medications, maybe there has to be an adjustment. If you're on insulin, um, you know, maybe you need to increase the insulin dose. If you're, the thing is that, you know, uh, for people that are type one, like, like Louise, I mean, if she, eats more and then adjusts the amount of insulin she takes to compensate for those extra carbs, those extra calories. If that doesn't get burned off, what happens is when your body has energy, it doesn't use. It stores it for later. How does it store it for later? It turns it into fat. So, you know, if, you know, if you were going to try to do that, to, you know, to compensate by taking more insulin, it, it's going to lead to weight gain, which right. you don't really want. So. At least we're not on medication. Right. Like, yeah. I was pre-diabetes. Uh -huh. And I got it, like, just point one into pre-diabetes from the last time. Okay. So, of course, now this time we have Christmas in there and everything else, but then it's like, well, this is real life for me. I mean, you watch, but I do splurge here and there. Right. So, I mean, it's just, like I say, it's real life, so, you know. Yeah, and, and, and people that try to deny themselves <laughs> completely, I mean, when they fall off the wagon, mm -hmm, yeah. they tend to go overboard. So, yeah, have, have a forkful of dessert mm -hmm. or two forkfuls of dessert. Don't deny yourself dessert completely, but, you know, don't go to the buffet and have five desserts. Right. Incorporate it with your meal. Okay. And the other thing with the A1C is that, you know, you could have fasting blood sugars that are normal. And, you know, because, because of what you're doing at night. Right. And you may have blood sugars after eating that are out of line and you don't know it because you're not testing them. Right. You know, so you might be, you know, 110 in the morning and then eat, you know, a, a stack of pancakes for breakfast and you, you know, your sugar two hours later is 250. Right. But you don't know that because you didn't test yeah. then. Your A1C is going to reflect that. So you could take your, your blood sugar readings, your log, into your doctor and show all these great fasting blood sugars. And the doctor looks at your A1C and says, yeah, your A1C 7.5, you know, maybe we need to do something a little bit different. That's going to give, and then that might get your doctor to say, why don't we test after eating a couple times? We don't have to do it every day, you know, a couple times a week just to see what it is. And then they may adjust your medication um, to compensate for what you're eating. I mean, they're... <laughs> but I cannot run yet, so. <laughs> nah. Yes. Okay. So what you eat and how much you eat will affect your blood sugar levels as well as the major organs of the body such as the heart, the blood vessels, lean protein, lots of vegetables, think green, 
and minimal starch and carbohydrates are the key to a healthy diet for diabetics. Portion size is also very important. Healthy eating will be discussed in more detail in an upcoming sweet spot class. Physical activity is incredibly important and included as one of the legs of our stool. Activity moves sugar from your blood into your cells. The more active you are, the lower your blood sugar level. Always consult your doctor before beginning a new exercise regimen. If you haven't been active for a while, start slow and build gradually. But if you're, you know, if you're going to take excursions off the, <laughs> you know, off of the, the cruise, okay. yeah, yeah, a lot of walking, and that'll help. Some people who have type 2 diabetes can manage their blood sugar levels through diet and exercise alone, but most people also require diabetes medications or insulin therapy. Which medications are best for you depends on many factors including your blood sugar level and any other health problems you have. Your doctor might even combine drugs from different classes to help you control your blood sugar. Diabetes medications work in five different ways. They can stimulate your pancreas to produce and release more insulin into your body. They can inhibit the production and release of sugar from your liver. They can block stomach enzymes that break down carbohydrates from the food you eat. They can improve the sensitivity of your body's cells to insulin. Finally, some medications work in the filters of your body, your, your kidneys. These types of medications help filter sugar out of the body. types of meds, mm -hmm. that explains why my sister's on three different, um, and I always thought it's like, oh my God, that's because your diabetes is that bad, but it's just that it's tr working in different ways. Right, and, and mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah, know that. yeah. Yeah, and I was always thinking like, oh my God, the care, you gotta watch better, but in reality, it's that it's treating three different ways. It, right, mm -hmm. so you can get, you can get the, the, the most benefit, mm -hmm. Um, from three with, different ones that versus, work by different yeah. mechanisms without you know that uh, I, I mean know, when I, I know she said this last visit that the doctor said well it was a while back but if so many visits everything was good she was going to take her off two of them and I could never like how can you go from three down to one but now that kind of depending what you know what's happening and why she's take which one she's taking her off yeah I, you know, unless, I mean, unless she's made some drastic lifestyle changes that would... She has. Okay, so she's losing weight, getting more exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then I, I would probably stop one and yeah. then the other rather than stop two things at once, but... Okay, so I learned something. Medications that work with the liver to reduce glucose in the bloodstream include the biguanides. These medications also improve the ability of insulin to move sugar into your muscle cells. Metformin, the most commonly used medication in the treatment of diabetes, is usually taken two or three times a day. It can cause some diarrhea and nausea, especially if taken without food but there's an extended release formula that may be taken once a day. Metformin can also have desirable side effects such as weight loss or a decrease in bad cholesterol. A lot of the, the diabetes medications now, they seem to be being promoted as not causing weight gain um, or causing weight loss. And uh, I think that that's like being touted too much. Mm -hmm. When your sugar goes up w over 180, the kidneys get rid of it. Well, when, when your kidneys are filtering out that excess sugar, that's all, also calories that you're peeing away. Now you take a drug to lower your blood sugar and those calories, instead of going down the toilet, are now staying in the body. And if you don't burn them off, the body's gonna store those extra calories as fat. So just about any, 
anybody who's got diabetes that's way out of control and then they start treatment and they get it under control, um, there's going to be a little bit of that weight gain just because you got the blood sugar under control. Um, which a lot of times people who are diagnosed are overweight and the doctor says you have to lose weight. Take this metformin and lose weight at the same time. So, you know, you, you kind of have this, you know, yeah. conflict um, and frustration. It creates a great deal of frustration. People, you know, I have people tell me, you know, I can't lose weight. You know, the doctor wants me to lose weight, but no matter what I do, I can't lose weight. And then you start talking to him about, well, what, were you, what was your sugar when you were diagnosed? Well, it was 400. Um, and what's, what are your sugars now? Well, you know, sometimes they're 150, sometimes they're below. Well, you think about anything over 180, you know, once you get over 180 and you're peeing all those calories away, now your sugars are, you know, 150 and your body's keeping all of those calories in. So, um, it does, it does result in some frustration for, for some people. Uh, but, you know, some of the newer medications they tout as, as, not, as not causing weight gain or as causing weight loss. Uh, I think if that's the selling point, then um, it's going to get people frustrated. <laughs> anyway, okay. Medications that help the pancreas, these medications have been around the longest and are safe for most people. They're often used to treat diabetes. They stimulate the release of insulin from the pancreas. When I was in college, essentially, this is what we had. Um, the sulfonylureas, um, you know, to stimulate the pancreas. To, and then once your pancreas wore out, then you were on insulin. <laughs> um, these types of medication are more likely to cause hypoglycemia because, like I said, they're, they're, they're stimulating your pancreas to release more insulin than, irregardless of what your blood sugar is. A drawback of these medications is that over several years they become less effective or stop working completely. If you drink alcohol, make sure your healthcare provider and pharmacist know can cause a problem with these medications. Other pancreas helpers include the injection simulin and the meg... Yeah. <laughs> um, simulin is an injection that's given just before a meal that stimulates the pancreas to release insulin. Common side effects include nausea and headache. So. Like I said, your A1C could be way out of line, even though you're fasting blood sugars, which would indicate. So this is a drug that they can use to combat that postprandial rise. It, you know, just acts for a short period of time. You know, you take it with a meal and and take care of uh, some of those extra carbohydrates. Maglitonides such as Prandin and Starlix work quickly to stimulate your pancreas to release insulin, but only when there's glucose in your blood. It's taken 15 to 30 minutes before meals. It can cause hypoglycemia, weight gain, nausea, and headache. So these are short acting. They work similar to the sulfonylureas, um, and, but you know they only work for a short period of time. So that helps combat that post-meal post rise in the blood sugar. Then there are medications that work in the liver, um, such as Actos, um, which improves the sensitivity of muscle and fat cells to insulin, inhibits the release of glucose from the insulin. The DPP-4 inhibitors slow the release of glucose from the liver and stimulate the release of insulin from the pancreas. They don't cause weight gain like some medications and can be used in combination with other medicines. They're usually taken once a day.
when when it re yeah when it reaches your stomach and intestines the food you eat is absorbed as starch this class of medications can help slow the breakdown of starch and some sugars they need to be taken with the first bite of each meal and are usually used with other medications to control blood sugar levels they don't cause weight gain but you may have stomach pain gas or diarrhea as a side effect so if you if you pre prevent those starches and complex carbohydrates from break down and they're going instead of being absorbed in your your small intestine they're passing through to your large intestine and then the bacteria in your large intestine get a hold of them that's you know that's where you end up with the the gas and diarrhea not not drugs that are that are used a whole lot the incretin mimetics are injected either daily twice daily or weekly they slow down digestion so that sugar enters your bloodstream more slowly so you're spreading that you don't get the spikes you're spreading out that that absorption they also stimulate the release of insulin and may suppress hunger and promote weight loss by helping you feel fuller longer most often they're used with other medications like metformin side effects can include nausea and headache There's a new class of medications called SGLT2 inhibitors that have been introduced to the market. These drugs act on the kidneys, also known as the filters of your body. And they help keep the sugar out of your blood. These medications have incredibly difficult names. <laughs> Don't worry. The pharmacists are always there to help you watch over your medications. Um, just like when your sugar goes up over 180, the kidneys filter it out. This, these drugs kind of do that even at lower blood sugar levels. So, I mean, one of the problems with them is that they can cause a little bit of dehydration because as they're taking sugar out, they're taking fluid with it. So it's important with these drugs to make sure that you drink enough to stay well hydrated. Patients living with type 2 diabetes may need insulin therapy in addition to taking oral medications. Unfortunately, normal digestion interferes with insulin taken by mouth, so insulin must be injected under the skin. Insulin injections involve using a fine needle and syringe or an insulin pen injector. The insulin pen is a device that looks very similar to an ink pen, except the cartridge is filled with insulin instead of ink used to be that we used to threaten people with type 2 diabetes that if you don't be good if you don't watch what you eat if you don't exercise you don't take your drugs you're going to end up on the needle well that was really the wrong approach because um, if you're good and you watch what you eat and you exercise and you take your medications you're going to live longer and if you live long enough with type 2 diabetes you're probably going to end up on insulin someday. It may not be until you're 90, but you know, so insulin may be your reward for, for taking better care of yourself. There are many types of insulin, rapid, rapid acting insulins, long acting insulins, intermediate acting insulins, Long-acting insulin, such as Lannis and Levomir, are typically taken once a day at bedtime to provide long-term control of blood sugar. Rapid-acting insulin, such as Humalog and Novolog, are taken with meals to provide insulin for the glucose you ingest at that meal. Most people use a combination of rapid and long-acting insulin. Your doctor and your pharmacist can help you determine which combination of insulin therapy is right for you. Then we have combination drugs. There are many tablets available that combine two different medicines into one pill. This is convenient and easier than taking two separate fills, 
separate pills. Unfortunately, these combinations may cost more. It's difficult to determine which medicine is working for you and causing side effects. Talk to your healthcare provider and pharmacist to determine your best options. So, for example, Janumet is a combination of Januvia and metformin. Um, so you may start off on metformin to c control your blood sugar. It's not working well enough, so the doctor adds Janumet, Janu Januvia to the, to the metformin. Rather than putting you on a combination right away, it, it may... Well, do, do the one, then add the, the next one, and then when you find that you need X milligrams of this and X milligrams of that, if there's a combination product that has that in it, then it makes sense maybe to, to reduce the pill load by using the combination drug. There's also a new tablet that combines medications to treat diabetes with a medication for cholesterol. Um, there's another product that they, they have a combination of uh, a cholesterol lowering agent and a, and a blood pressure lowering agent. So you know, when, I was, when I was in school, there were a lot of combination products um, and the drug industry kind of got away from the combination products for the last 30 years. Now we're starting to see more, more combination products work their way back onto the market. Um, just because I think people are taking so many pills, they want to reduce the number of pills that they're taking. And it's, it's marketing for the, <laughs> the drug companies. The main drawback to this particular combination is the price. The combination tablet sells for about the same price as Genuvia. So you, may be able so you may be able to save a little money if you take both of these. If interested, discuss it with your pharmacist or your doctor. Let's take a moment to talk about a side effect that can be severe if not handled appropriately, hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. While the goal of lifestyle changes in medication therapy is to lower high glucose levels, we don't want glucose to get too low. Anything under 70 is technically considered too low. As we mentioned before, glucose and insulin are a balancing act and your body needs both to function properly. Your blood sugar level can drop for many reasons, including skipping a meal or getting more physical activity than normal. That's why checking your blood sugar is so important. Signs of low blood sugar include sweating, shakiness or weakness, sudden hunger or drowsiness, dizziness, headache, blurred vision, heart palpitations, slurred speech, or mental confusion. If you have signs or symptoms of low blood sugar, eat or drink something that will quickly raise your blood sugar, sugar level. Fruit juice, glucose tablets, hard candy, regular soda, not diet, or another source of sugar. Retest in 15 minutes to be sure your blood glucose levels are normal. If they're not, treat again and retest in another 15 minutes. So you want to, you want to, if you want to bring your sugar up, um, you, know, you know, say you test your blood sugar in 60, you want to bring that up about 50 points. And 15 grams of carbohydrate should be enough it to bring it up. That fast. And yeah, and depending on, depending on what your source is. Now, if, if you, if you took table sugar, regular sugar, um, Sucrose isn't processed as fast in the body as fructose. So like the fructose in, a, in soda mm -hmm. or in an orange juice or in one of those juice boxes. I, I, I like those juice boxes, those four ounce mm -hmm. juice boxes that the kids take in their lunch. They have about 15 grams of carbohydrate and it's, and it's fructose. So your body can break the fructose down and get it into the bloodstream faster than it can sucrose, which is 
the uh, table sugar. I didn't know that. I didn't know either. So. If it would have been a multiple choice question, like which would go faster, I would have gone with the sugar. Yeah. yeah. Now you can get glucose tablets. That doesn't right. have to be broken down at all. That's right. already the simple sugar. But sucrose, the, the, the sugar that's on the table, is actually two glucose molecules that are connected together. Um, I can't rem it's been too long. I don't remember. Fructose is actually two different simple sugars that are connected together, but they break apart more easily than to the two glucose molecules. So you take your 15 grams of carb and you wait 15 to 30 minutes and you test again and see where it is. And then now some pe I know some people that will, you know, test again in five minutes and it's not where they want it to be. So then they take more, and, you know, they're not waiting long enough. And then, or, you know, they used to, when I was in school, they used to tell say to, you know, tell people to drink a Coke. Well, in the late '70s, Coca-Cola came in a seven-ounce bottle. Now it comes in a 20-ounce bottle. <laughs> so, if you tell somebody to drink a Coke and they drink a 20-ounce Coke instead of their sugar being 60, um, now it's going to be 260. <laughs> you know. So. Each one of us takes a different combination of medicines and dosages. If you know why you need your medicines and you understand how they work, you're more likely to take them. We can also help you set up a schedule with your medicines, and most importantly, we can help you stick to it. There are many boxes, containers, alarms, other methods, met methods that make sure you don't forget. Ask us about your medications, doctors, pharmacists, and other healthcare providers have spent a lot of time learning all this complicated stuff, and we're here to make it easy for you to understand and remember. Just ask. Diabetes is a disease that can be managed with lifestyle choices and medication. There's no set plan that works for everyone. Ask questions, learn as much as you can about diabetes and the medications you used to treat it. We're looking forward to a wonderful year. Don't, don't miss out. See you next month. That's more as exercise. Is walking like yep. a good 30 minutes? That's enough. Yep. Um, not, not, you know, a it brisk, takes, but not. It takes as much energy to walk a mile as it does to run a mile. It just takes a little bit more time. Okay. So. I just can't seem to get into anything more than walking. Yeah. I just can't. I, I have good intentions. Mel, my daughter even bought a couple videos that she had and stuff. Maybe one, maybe two days and that's it. It's just not my cup. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it helps if you have somebody, yeah. you know, to walk with. And I find I walk at night, like after nine o'clock. But it's safe where I'm at, you know. Even Christmas night when it was so cold, because Karen goes, are you going out? I said, I know not. <laughs> but it, that was a short, that was only a 15 minute job. But, you know, I was out. Yeah, you I was want, out. You, know. you, you want to walk at a pace that's enough to get your heart mm -hmm. rate up. And that I'm winded a little bit. Yeah. That's what I was told. Yeah. Not, want, not like gasping for air, but like till I come back in, it's like, <sighs> okay, you know, I'm, I'm winded. <laughs> Complications. And what's the date? It would be the Wednesday. We won't that's when our cruise is. Okay. We leave the twenty fifth. Yay. Sorry. <laughs> well yeah, this month there are five. Yeah, so it'll be five weeks from today. This month there are five Wednesdays. So the Fourth Wednesday would be actually the 28th, I think. Mm -hmm. 
that yep. out already? Yep, I figured that out already. <laughs> yep. Yep. We won't be here. Okay.